There'd been a number of uh, different venues in which sort of indoor playing was, was taking place from schools and universities, drama, through to the Inns of Court in London, which we know was a really important breeding ground for what then became the sort of commercial drama of, of the early modern period that we all know and, and, and understand. So it's, it's not as though that the indoor playhouses sort of appeared fully formed overnight. They come out of this longer tradition, which had seen people, particularly in educational contexts, having a go at performances in candlelight in smaller, more intimate spaces, often with select audiences. And that feeds into, I suppose, what becomes uh, the fee-paying indoor playhouses uh, of, of the early 17th century. Well, I suppose it's really interesting to think about how theatrical legal training is. I mean, even in a contemporary courtroom, you can think about performances taking place. The way that barristers are trained is to perform roles, to stage debates. And I think there was an understanding that, in a way, rhetoric was practised through putting on plays. So there's a, a debating structure that feeds into it. There's also a kind of festive culture that feeds into it too. Inns of court seem to have particularly enjoyed their revels and their evenings. So the two things combine this sort of educational learning opportunity that is putting on a play, learning a part, holding your own, as it were, on the stage, and the whole festive culture of nights of festivity and celebration on particular events, and these, th these things come together. Very interesting that the, the Shakespeare play that we know that was performed at the Inns of Court is Twelfth Night, which seems to bring both of those possibilities in, into a really interesting encounter. a former priory so for that reason it had uh, a special sort of status in the city of London it was a liberty at that point it makes it easier to do things like construct a playhouse but there had been an earlier playhouse there too in a slightly different part of the building the first Blackfriars Playhouse where uh, a children's company had performed that had closed down in 1584 so there's a sort of theatrical history on the site as well but Burbage, always with an eye to business opportunities, I suppose seeing in, in a part the sort of growing appetite for uh, theatre in the city, and in particular the location is tempting because it's near to things like the Inns of Court, and as well as acting we know that lawyers were great playgoers. They're a kind of core set of people in the audiences of the time, so he knows he's got a ready market. Um, it's just across the way from the royal wardrobes. There's also access to costumes and props. Very interesting set of decisions that might have taken him to that site. Um, runs into trouble quite quickly. A lot of opposition from the neighbourhood because suddenly you're just within the city walls, as it were, and people are worrying about the coaches that will be dropping off uh, audience members, the crowding, the, the noise, the interruption to their daily lives. So it doesn't get off to a flying start. And in its early incarnation, it's very much a children's company that has its moment there. It's not really until 1608 when actually the Blackfriars ceases to be a liberty uh, and the King's men really take over playing there, that it comes into its own as a uh, site for adult companies. So certain districts and areas of London were uh, officially liberties and they were therefore free from uh, the parish jurisdiction, the civic jurisdiction that other areas and neighbourhoods and wards of the city might have been. Uh, areas of Southwark were liberties and that's why the Bankside theatres grow up alongside Paris Garden and the bear baiting and so on. And again, a number of uh, former religious house, uh, houses and monastery sites in London were liberties um, for slightly different reasons. But again, they become the focus of the theatrical entrepreneurs who, with an eye to possibility, focus on these areas as, as sites for building and sites to um, produce playhouses without too much planning restriction, I guess. It's a really interesting thing to think about whether there was a, a totally distinct audience for plays at the Blackfriars. And I think that it would be a misnomer to suggest that somehow um, a totally different set of clientele came to these plays. Nevertheless, they were smaller, um, whereas the Globe had held something like two, two and a half thousand people. Uh, the Blackfriars would have been about 600 to 700, so very different, and therefore the pricing structures are different. And that automatically, I suppose, becomes at least in part self-selecting. And 
as I've said, the geography of the Blackfriars means that it's in the city, so it's m much easier to reach. You don't have to take a, a waterman's boat across as you do to the globe. So we're looking at the um, demographic, as it were, that goes to these plays, the lawyers, the citizenry. The new sort of Blackfriars uh, clientele who are growing up is quite an interesting neighbourhood, quite mixed in terms of it has a prison, it has, but it also has some really grand residences. Um, people who were part of Ben Johnson's circle, like Sir Esme Stewart, Lord Daubigny, live in the Blackfriars neighbourhood. And it's clear that he and his circle, as it were, were part of the audience for the Blackfriars. So slightly more elite, but not wholly so, would be my answer. And we need to keep that, that sense of, of an overlap between not only the repertoire of these theatres, but the audience members as well. indoor candlelit, which is a fundamental difference to the open air amphitheatres which had to perform in daylight, um, so now you can have later evening performances. That creates its own dynamic um, because you have to trim your candles. So we start to have act breaks being taken while that happens. So it actually changes the, the physical shape of a play as well to be in this space. Audience sit, sit, sitting on three sides. Um, so quite close to the action and seated, there's another difference with the open air amphitheatres. We no longer have the, the groundlings, as it were, in the pit standing. Nevertheless, quite close to the stage, um, very much something that the actors would have been highly conscious of. And from references in, in a number of the plays, we're aware that some uh, members of the audience got to actually sit on the stage. And that changes the dynamic of what happens with plays as well. Musicians in a gallery over the stage, and the musicians become a very important part of the, the Blackfriars theatrical community, as it were. Because it's small, because it's candlelit, people can see each other, it's an audience that's very self-conscious and we're aware of the candlelight picking up the beautiful fabrics of the wonderful clothes that they're wearing because so many of the play playwrights make a reference to that. Um, people come to see and be seen, it's very clear. It's really interesting to think about, firstly, the kind of repertoire that the children's company, the Children of the Queen's Revels, have at the Blackfriars in the early decade, as it were, of the 17th century, 1600 to about 1608, when they're at their prime. And that company does seem to have, have had a preference for certain kinds of genres. So that would suggest that the audience is also willing to pay again and again on subsequent nights to see those genres. I mean, they're, they're commercial enterprises. They know that they need to get those bums on seats, as it were. And satire becomes something that's very much associated with the children's company. Um, pushing the edges, as it were, pushing the boundaries of acceptability in all kinds of ways, which is why the plays in that era run into various kinds of problems with the authorities. But social satire, political satire, highly comic, and perhaps there is something about a group of, of boys doing the acting, of varying ages, but nevertheless there's something already sort of hyper-real about that situation that allows them, I think, to be a little bit edgier in terms of the topics that they take on. So we have some of the um, earliest revenge dramas, which are really pushing the, uh, the connection, as it were, between tragedy and comedy, very dark, macabre comedy, and Marston's The Malcontent is a wonderful example. Um, we have the, uh, the first very similar plays, as it were, plays that are set in London, that are about their moment and time, it really takes off as, as a genre, what becomes known as the city comedies, and they will carry on in interest over the decades. I suppose some changes come then when the adult company, the King's Men, become the sort of chief players and perhaps some of that really dark, macabre sat satire falls away slightly in favour of more robust versions of city comedy and Jacobean tragedy. But never nevertheless, in the same way, I think playing off the space and the audience and the new opportunities that the indoor theatres gives the repertoire. So I think they were popular. Um, one of the things you can always tell is, is to look at the sort of the hard business and marketing side of things. Um, if a certain type of play is a success, you suddenly get a cluster of them. And you can see that um, both with the kinds of satirical dramas that I've mentioned and with the city comedies. Plays start to refer to each other. They start to build off each other. And that suggests that not only are they um, expecting audiences to, to get those references, but that they're coming back for more on regular occasions. 
playwrights uh, get commissioned to write types of plays because they're successful. And we might imagine that something like Eastwood Ho, which Ben Jonson and John Marston and George Chapman are commissioned to write, is a direct response to other plays of its kind that have proved popular, in fact, for rival companies. Absolutely. I mean, we all use that commonplace line from Hamlet about holding the mirror, as it were, up to nature. But in all kinds of ways, city comedy, social satire about London endlessly tells the audience it's turning the mirror on them. Um, our scene is London and so on and so forth. And they seem to have loved that, even though in many ways these plays have quite deep criticisms of what's going on. There seems to be an attraction of seeing something that's absolutely of its moment, of its place and time, of that month, in that year. There are references to particular plague outbreaks or to new buildings that have sprung up or even allusions to particular individuals. And that frisson of the immediate just seems to have excited, in particular, the Blackfriars audience. The Blackfriars seems to be a theatre that loved novelty. It's attracted to fashion and the voguish in all kinds of ways, from the kinds of costumes that people are wearing to the um, animals that they bring on stage to the props that they're carrying. And there seems to have been a pleasure in that for the audience of, of seeing the new items that are available for purchase, as it were, up on the stage, the new buildings that they might have even walked past on the way to the theatre, referred to and perhaps even involved in the plot line of these plays. So even though there's biting satire, and in some ways trenchant criticism, they're drawn back again and again um, as, as like moss to a flame. I think it's really interesting that um, the Blackfriars sort of finds its moment around about 1604-5 in the first instance. One, we have a new king on the throne. Uh, king James VI has come down from Scotland to become King James I of England in 1603. And in all kinds of ways, you can see playwrights responding to that new moment of the Jacobean era. What's it going to be like? What are its problems? What are its questions? So there are political and theological and social issues. And there's anxiety about what James's court is doing. Very rapidly, James seems to set a tone um, that is about aspiration and mobility and money. He sells knighthoods very famously. Suddenly, you're able to purchase a position in society that would not have been possible before. And with that comes a whole set of anxieties. Along with that, London is developing at a tremendous rate. The population is just soaring. People are coming in not only from the European mainland for work, um, but they're coming in from the provinces of England as well. So the dynamic of that is such that you've got overcrowding, you've got competition for jobs, you've got aspirational people in the city. And I think it's a really heady moment in, when, in which that kind of moment of governmental change coincides with really dramatic and rapid societal change. And the plays almost, they can't help themselves but want to respond to that moment. Money. Money is such a big driver in all of this, from the king's sale of titles through to your average uh, goldsmith's workshop on the make in Cheapside. And the plays pick up on that and they respond to that. So you see coins changing hands. You see people talking about money. It's both a, a tangible and a, a conceptual presence on the stage because it's changing the way that people think about society, about rank, about identity, even about gender. Very interesting that, that James VI and I actually castigates women in particular in the, in the 1600s because of their propensity to come to London and shop and the damage that is doing uh, to the economy. Really interesting moment. And so we might think about why suddenly there are all these rapacious women consuming goods in city comedies when the king himself is raising that as an issue. So the Children of the Queen's Revels seem to have wanted a play that would think about uh, a group of people in a particular area of London because they'd seen the success of their rivals with a play called uh, Westwood Ho, which had been written by Thomas Decker and John Webster. 
and we're assuming that was a big hit because they want to come in with a version of their own. They choose a different area of London instead of going westward, they decide to go eastward. But nevertheless, there's an interest in city comedy, in this kind of material that's about the geography, moral, social, cultural uh, of the city at the time. And the, and the children of the Queen's Revels uh, bring in, as it were, some really sort of cutting edge dramatists to have a go at their version with Eastwood Ho. So we get Ben Johnson, uh, we, we get uh, John Marston, who's actually in chambers at the Inns of Court at the time, so very much part of this legal world on the edges of the Blackfriars that we've previously referred to, and we get George Chapman. And they've all been writers, interestingly, who have been living a little on the edge, shall we say, with their material. They've been in and out of trouble uh, in, over the last sort of five years prior to the writing of Eastwood Ho. So it seems almost as if the Commission is deliberately bringing in people who will uh, take some risks with the material. We shouldn't be surprised at all that it has three authors. We perhaps can be surprised that it's very difficult with this play to distinguish um, any way in which the, the play was sort of portioned out amongst them. Sometimes it's a bit easier with collaborative writing, which was fairly standard practice in the theatre writing world of the time. These were commercial enterprises and people would be given areas of plays to write that they were particularly strong at. Someone might be a very good plotter, somebody might be particularly known for their comic scenes and we've certainly seen a number of other plays where that kind of collaborative writing takes place but this really does seem to have been a sort of tripartite venture as it were in which you can't really pull the, pull the pieces apart and say well there's a Johnsonian moment, there's a Marston moment. They talk about writing it as a team and it very very much has that, that feeling. We don't know of another play that the three of them wrote together, though there's all kinds of ways in which their work commented on and responded to each other's work through the years that come. And of course, we have so many lost plays that we don't want to make too many assumptions from the sort of tip of the iceberg, if it were, of what we have extant. It's possible that other things were practiced, um, set aside. It's also possible Johnson was a great writer out of his collaboration, so, so who knows. But this one, he seems to have been very uh, keen to retain a sense of this having been a team effort, which is interesting. Well, we do know that it got into terrible trouble. Uh, and one of the reasons might be to think about when it was first performed. It's, the play is entered on the stationer's register, um, which is how we know about most of the plays and their titles from this time in September of 1605. But it seems to have been performed over that summer. Now, that would have meant it was in some ways an illegal or illicit performance that had not yet had the full approval of the Lord Chamberlain, because we know that the King, uh, James VI and I, and the Lord Chamberlain were part of a royal progress in Oxford in, um, in July and August of that summer. So what we probably have is a, a quasi-illicit performance, sort of pre-formal approval, um, and it gets into trouble. Why does it get into trouble? Well, because it has some fairly blatant comments in its initial scripting around the new court of James, and in particular the Scottish entourage that he brought down with him from Edinburgh. There seems to have been an anxiety about this sudden plethora of Scottish voices and uh, ambitions, as it were, in, in the court of Westminster, and the play picks up on that and got into trouble as a result of that. So the, uh, the writers are actually taken temporarily into prison, not the first time, for a number of them, but nevertheless it clearly um, struck a chord and uh, caused quite a few concerns at the Jacobean court. I think censorship is a, is a very big term and maybe we need to think of it in terms of control as being a little bit more happenstance and kind of full censorship would suggest. It's clear that plays were looked at, that lines were taken out and struck out, that sometimes plays ran into trouble and there's a number of plays in, in Johnson and Marston's careers that do that. So what seems to happen rather is there's a bit of give and take, quite a lot of leeway is allowed but when people overstep a mark as it were, things are reined back in. There are certain areas um, that were no go, um, up until the death of Elizabeth I it had been in legal, for example, to represent the monarch on stage. So there were certain things you didn't do, but nevertheless the playwrights were very inventive at finding ways around all of this. So yes, there was control. You had to have things approved through the Master of the Revels. Um, a plays would be subject to change. But nevertheless, when we look at what actually made it up onto the stage, I don't think we can think of this as an incredibly authoritarian regime. It's just a 
fantastically rich play in so many ways. It's full of places and spaces and it thinks about the way that place makes identity and makes meaning. We move from a, a tavern in Billingsgate to the coastline of the Isle of Dogs in a matter of moments. Very, very rich in terms of the way in which it thinks about how we are all shaped by the environment we live in. But at its heart is this world of money and aspiration and I think Gertrude is such a fantastic character to think about in this light with her fervent longing, need, craving for coaches, for a castle in the country which turns out to be a castle in the air. I mean, that's a line in the play. When we first see her on the stage, she's surrounded by people carrying fabrics and um, costumes and the latest sort of trinkets and fashions of the day. This would be a play that um, is surprisingly full of things on the stage. You can imagine the candlelight of the Blackfriars picking up on all of that rich material as Paul Davy, the, the tailor, sort of fusses a, around them. And um, she even has a, a, a lady-in-waiting, as it were, of a sort, bringing on a little pet monkey. And um, it's brilliant to think about what that might have said to people in the audience who were themselves clamouring to have the sort of latest, most fashionable lap dog or pet monkey of the day, um, to suddenly see that up on the stage. And what that was saying about them and their, their craving for novelty, for fashion, for voguish behaviour. So the language is incredibly rich, the presence of objects on the play is incredibly rich. Um, and you also have somewhere beyond London being evoked too, Eastwood Ho. So Petronel Flash, the ambitious but also bankrupt knight, is heading to the Virginia colony. He doesn't make it, of course, and that's part of the high comedy of the play. But nevertheless, this, this um, discussion of the new world, the aspirations of, of the way in which the, the England of exploration and of colonisation um, feeds into the, um, the dreams and the full streams of this play, very remarkable. So its geography is both incredibly local and incredibly global at the same time.